move uh, to the next uh, point in the uh, in the agenda which is the uh, appointment of a member of the executive board of the European Central Bank. Uh, so we will have the exchange of views uh, with uh, the candidate, Frank Anderson, Ed Elderson. So I'm pleased to welcome Frank Elderson, uh, who is a candidate for this position. The ECB executive board member, Yves Merge, uh, will leave his functions on December 14th after a term of office of eight years in accordance with Article 283, Paragraph 2 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, the European Parliament is consulted on the Council's recommendation on the appointment of the Executive Board members of the European Central Bank. On October 14, 2020, the European Council consulted Parliament on the appointment of Frank Elderson for a term of office of eight years, with effect from December 15, 2020. Ahead of today's public hearing, the candidate has received a written questionnaire of 53 questions. The replies by the candidate together with his uh, curriculum are annexed to the draft report on this uh, appointment. The hearing will be followed by a vote tomorrow afternoon. Uh, the Econ Committee will then submit a proposal for a European Parliament decision on the Council's recommendation regarding uh, Mr. Elderson's appointment. The plenary vote is planned at the November uh, plenary, uh, second, second plenary. After an introductory statement by Mr. Elderson of maximum 10 minutes, I will open a Q&A session with ECON members with two minutes for the question and three minutes for the answer. So now, Mr. Elderson, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, dear. Madam Chair, Honourable Members of the European Parliament, it is an honour for me to speak to you today. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 restrictions make it impossible to come to the Parliament physically. But as soon as the circumstances allow, uh, it will be my privilege to meet with you in person. This hearing takes place at a time of great challenge for Europe. COVID has caused deep human suffering throughout our communities and it has um, taken a severe toll on our economies. The climate crisis remains as daunting and as urgent as ever. These challenges present us policymakers with a solemn responsibility. Both the European Parliament and the European Central Bank have a key role to play in steering Europe through the current crisis and in making it a better and stronger place for the future. Being fully conscious of the importance of this moment, I feel especially and honored to have been selected as a candidate for member of the executive board of the ECB. And I welcome this hearing as a key step in the appointment process. Central bankers are independent and unelected, yet their decisions have enormous impacts on the lives of our citizens. For their legitimacy, it is essential that central banks operate within their legal mandates, listen to the concerns of the public and account for their decisions to the people and to you, their representatives. In my short remarks, I will outline my experience before discussing my views on the challenges facing the ECB and Europe in the near and medium term. Finally, I will turn to gender diversity. I have been a central banker for most of my career. I've been a member of the governing board of the Dutch Central Bank for more than nine years. Um, at the European level, I'm a member of the ECB supervisory board and I served as one of the first members of the Single Resolution Board. At the international level, I'm a member of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, and I chair the Central Banks and, and Supervisors Network for Greening the Financial System, the NGFS. In these roles, I have learned how bringing different people and voices together leads to better decision-making and more effective policies. As a lawyer, 
I myself have often brought a different perspective to decision making, highlighting the need for sound legal bases and the importance of adhering to the principle of proportionality. I have learned that good leadership is to keep a keen eye on developments that at first do not appear relevant to a central bank, but which on closer scrutiny may have a big impact on its objectives. I began my remarks with the challenges Europe faces. Let me now briefly set out my views on how the ECB can help to overcome them. The foremost amongst these is COVID. The ECB has played a crucial role in cautioning the economic blow from the COVID-19 crisis by easing financing conditions for firms, households and governments. The ECB has shown a steadfast commitment to its mandate to maintain price stability as laid down in the treaty. Notably, it acknowledged that inflation that is too low for an extended period of time can be as problematic as inflation that is too high. Going forward, the ECB should continue to do whatever it can within its mandate as long as necessary to mitigate the economic impact of the pandemic. As a member of the executive board of the ECB, I would adhere to its course of unfaltering commitment to its mandate and agility under changing circumstances. I welcome that in these challenging times, the ECB is conducting its strategy review, ensuring that the ECB continues to fulfill its mandate requires not only discussing its definition of price stability, it also requires assessing whether the instruments for achieving price stability are still appropriate. However, monetary policy does not operate in isolation. The effectiveness of the ECB's policies is greatly supported by policies in the supervisory and in the fiscal domains. First, a robust financial sector is key to supporting the, econ the economy during the recovery. And the SSM has taken important supervisory and capital relief measures to allow banks to keep financing the economy. What we need to do now, despite it, its challenges, is to complete the banking union, including a European deposit insurance scheme. Also, large investments needed, needed for the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis underline the importance of finally creating a genuine capital markets union. Second, the current crisis calls for a continued strong role for fiscal policy. With its strong element of solidarity, Next Generation EU is a game changer. It will provide much needed support and promote new sources of growth, especially for those suffering most from the pandemic. And in doing so, it will not only benefit each member state, but also the European Union as a whole. This leads me to two developments that are at the top of the EU's agenda, including yours. Developments that will be of major relevance to Europe and to the ECB in the coming years. Digitalization and climate change. The pandemic is accelerating the digital transformation in a way that is likely to reshape our economies and societies. Technological innovation in finance is a good thing. It will enable cheaper, faster and more secure services, increase competition and financial inclusion, and thereby enhance people's welfare. But it raises fundamental questions, including about digital sovereignty, the role of big techs, and about the future development of a digital euro. Central banks should stay on top of developments and think long term and broaden the dialogue for example, with privacy regulations, uh, regulators, infrastructure players, and the wider public. The COVID-19 crisis also provides an impetus to the transition toward a carbon neutral economy. The ECB has a, res a responsibility to contribute within its mandate 
to addressing the longer term challenges our economies are facing, in particular climate change. This requires action today. And in this regard, I commend this Parliament on its work on the EU taxonomy. The taxonomy is an important step in the process of greening the financial sector. It provides a reliable basis for follow-up policy actions, including greater clarity on what are the most harmful activities. When it comes to monetary policy, the ECB should explore how it could design, again within its mandate, its instruments to adequately manage climate-related risks and to contribute to unlocking investments that support the green transition. In its supervisory role, the ECB must make sure that banks adequately manage climate-related risks. And now I would like to say something on diversity, on gender diversity in particular. I know many of you would have preferred to have a hearing both with a female and a male candidate. I know of your concerns regarding gender diversity. I share them. The European Union is founded on equal rights and on the very value of diversity. As expressed in its motto, in varietate concordia. Diversity is our treasure and it is time we unleash its full potential. Within the Dutch Central Bank, I have actively promoted diversity, including gender diversity. And we have shown that positive change is perfectly possible. The aim is and has to be gender equality. And as a member of the Executive Board, I would strongly advocate that the ECB and all national central banks and all national competent authorities commit to that very aim and achieve it. Beyond bringing our own house in order, we can and should require more from financial institutions to make their boards and their staff composition more diverse. Not just as a box ticking exercise, but to achieve real change. The Capital Requirements Directive that you have co-legislated gives us supervisors a sound legal basis to do just that. If confirmed as a member of the Executive Board, I will do my utmost to make this a greater priority. The challenges are many, but we can meet them, working together in mutual trust and good cooperation. If confirmed, it is in this spirit that I would like to seek to contribute to the ECB's important work and work with you, the European Parliament, for the benefit of the Euro area and the prosperity of its citizens. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to this hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we can start our Q&A session and uh, we start uh, with Marcus Ferber from EPP. Yeah, thank you very much, Irene. Dear Mr. Elderson, uh, it's a pleasure having you here, although it's only uh, uh, virtual and, and not alive, but I hope uh, in the times to come and you have an eight years mandate, if approved, uh, there's a chance to meet in person as well. I have two short questions. During the ongoing economic crisis in light of the pandemic, the ECB has widely been regarded as having acted quickly and decisively by introducing a 750 billion euro pandemic emergency purchase program, the famous PEP. In June, the ECB governing council decided to increase the 750 billion envelope for the PEP by 600 billion in total for 1.350 billion. 1,000 billion, sorry, although the initial envelope had not been exhausted yet. Though there is an expectation by market participants that the ECB will yet again increase the envelope volume in December. 
Where do you see the ECB limits for the program in terms of practical and legal constraints? Are there diminishing returns to ever larger envelopes? And when do we hit the constraint of a prohibition of monetary state financing as well? The legal constraints the European Court of Justice has imposed for the public sector purchasing program. And my second question, the ECB had recently announced that bonds with coupons linked to sustainability performance targets will soon become eligible as central bank collateral. Some argue that the ECB should be a lot more proactive in pursuing a green monetary policy by favoring green bonds in the ECB's asset purchasing program. Do you see any financial stability risks in this area? Is there a risk of green bubbles? How do you square the idea of the ECB buying large amounts of green bonds in a fairly small market with the idea of market neutrality? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ferro, for these, uh, these questions. Um, as to your first question uh, on the um, uh, pandemic um, emergency program, um, I would think that um, so far the program has been uh, successful. Um, it has helped to stabilize markets. Um, sovereign spreads have come, um, have come in. Um, so have corporate spreads. Um, uh, and um, um, fragmentation has, um, has decreased. Um, there has been a vigorous issuance also of, uh, of debt by, um, by non-financial uh, corporates, um, more than double actually the average of the amount of the last five years. Um, uh, so I think that um, one can say that the, um, that the PEP has done so far what it was intended to do. Um, but it's very important to indeed underline that it is a temporary program. Um, it says PEP, Pandemic Emergency uh, Purchase Program, which means that it is tied to the, to the pandemic. It's temporary, it's target, targeted, and it must be as all um, um, uh, measures of the, um, of the ECB, it must be proportional. Uh, so the goals that it seeks to achieve um, need to be uh, proportionate to the, to the actual, um, actual instrument and the size of it and the duration of it um, that, is, uh, that is being used to reach these, uh, to reach these goals. Um, again, um, in, my, uh, in my vision, um, the, um, the, the, the PEP actually also together uh, with other um, uh, emergency um, uh, measures that have been taken by, by, by other authorities, uh, but also uh, the, the Teltro uh, by the ECB uh, have helped to counteract the, um, the immediate uh, fallout of the crisis, has helped to channel um, funds to, um, to the banking system, uh, has helped uh, to channel funds to SMEs, uh, to households, uh, to firms more in general, uh, and has um, has stabilized a situation that that we faced uh, this um, in this 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 spring. Uh, again, uh, we need um, to have um, we need to always uh, be careful uh, that we uh, that we keep in mind that everything we do needs to fit in our legal mandate. Uh, that everything uh, that we do needs to be proportional. Um, and as I said, uh, this program is um, is temporary. It's targeted, uh, and so far, um, I think it has done what it was set out to um, to do by the by the governing council. Um, as regards to your second question and um, the role that the ECB um, uh, can or cannot play uh, in terms of climate change, I think by now it is no longer controversial that climate change. Um, Droughts, floods, heat waves, wildfires, windstorms, etc., have an impact on the real economy, uh, have an impact on the volatility of economic activity, on the volatility of inflation, um, and uh, and not just climate change, but also transition policies uh, that are being legislated by governments and by the EU. Um, so it only makes sense for the uh, for the ECB to incorporate. Um, these insights in its um, uh, analyses um, and, um, and in its toolkit. Um, now, I welcome the fact, because there's many questions here and it's early days, 
um, I welcome the fact that the ECB has actually uh, decided that in its strategy review there is a specific working group uh, on this issue uh, that will look at all these various aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Pedro Marquez from SMB. Can, can, can you hear me now, uh, Madam Chair? We can hear you, Mr. We can hear you, Mr. Martin. Thank you so much. I was trying to connect properly. Um, Mr. Alderson, thank you so much for, for a, your initial statement. Let me be clear and let me start where you ended. The gender dimension of this process is a ve very critical one for my political group. Uh, it, this is obviously not personal, this is not about you in particular, it's about the way how this indication, the process of indication of candidates to these positions have evolved uh, frequently, and the fact that gender dimension is repeatedly not taking into account indication of candidates, and I wanted to be clear on this. But let me put some concrete question to you. Uh, the economic situation is what we know. Uh, we cannot say at this moment, at least it is at least uncertain how we will go out of this crisis, even if fiscal policy has delivered in the immediate response to this crisis and also monetary policy again, fortunately. Um, we are in the midst of the crisis of a century and with a lot of uncertainty on how to go out of it. So we are, and we will be very far away from the inflation objective uh, set by the ECB. And obviously the risk of mass and long-term unemployment is huge and also a great impact in, in public debts throughout Europe. So my question is, with the current difficulties on the transmission of monetary policy, um, what kind of policies do you foresee that the ECB should evaluate uh, and if he should indeed evaluate alternative non-conventional monetary policy so that we can actually go closer to the inflation objective and so that monetary policy can have an additional role in the response to this crisis now and for the years to come, for some years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Marquez, for this, uh, for this question. And I think you, you are completely right in pointing out that we are in, um, um, in a very severe uh, situation. Uh, and um, we should just not, uh, not lose sight of the fact that since the beginning of this year, um, more than 5 million um, of our citizens have lost their jobs. Um, to just give you a very uh, poignant example of that situation. Um, I agree with you that um, the ECB, in the various measures that it has taken, um, and unlike maybe the last time, if you want to refer to the great financial crisis as last time, uh, now various authorities have worked together, I think, in a very, um, very good manner. Um, not just the monetary policy uh, side of the ECB, but also the, the SSM in giving relief to the banks and making sure that they can keep on uh, lending to the economy, uh, to the uh, to households, to SMEs, uh, but also uh, on the on the fiscal side, um, both in terms of individual member states and, of course, um, in um, uh, within the framework of the EU Next Generation Program uh, on the EU level. So here we have. Uh, fiscal authorities uh, on different levels, um, banking supervisory authorities and monetary authorities working together to um, to weather uh, to weather this 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 storm, which indeed it certainly is. Um, as to your question, um, I think it is uh, it is uh, known that the uh, on you know on the shorter uh, shorter term, the uh, ECB has clearly stated that. Uh, uh, for the next meeting, uh, policy meeting in uh, in December, they will uh, recalibrate uh, all uh, all the uh, instruments. It has also said that there is room um, uh, on all these various uh, instruments. Um, so um, I think there, um, the ECB, as ever, stands ready uh, to do um, whatever is needed within its mandate um, to um, to 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 strive towards um, its aim of um, uh, price stability as defined by the Governing Council as um, below but close to 2% in the medium term. Um, 
on the longer run, in terms of evaluating how these various um, also unorthodox uh, measures have worked out, um, and then I mean the, the, the asset purchase programs, then I mean the, the PEP, I mean uh, the, forward, uh, the forward guidance, I mean the negative uh, rate, uh, interest uh, rate policy, the NERB, all these various um, instruments and the, um, the experience that we now have had uh, with them, I'm sure uh, are going to be and are being discussed in the statutory review of the ECB. Uh, I think that the chair, uh, the, the president of the ECB has said that no stone uh, will be left unturned. Um, so I can assure you uh, that as far as I understand, um, this evaluation uh, is taking place and will take place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Caroline Naptegal. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and also a warm welcome to Mr. Elderson. And I would like to ask you two questions on two important, but well, let's say quite different topics. So my first question, um, well, you are a lawyer, you are an expert, you are a man, and in my opinion, you are a man fit for the job. However, and the previous speaker mentioned it as well, you are fully aware of the sensitivities regarding your appointment. But I would like to take a sort of a different approach regarding this discussion, because no, no, none of us uh, doubts your qualities. And in fact, we need the capabilities you have to get Europe stronger out of the economic crisis. So regarding the, the gender balance issue, you have uh, given extensive answers in the questionnaire and have been showing a strong commitment in your introduction about this topic. So in my opinion, you could be a true ambassador on this gender balance topic. So I think that we have to embrace that instead of punishing you for a process where there was no influence from your side. Um, so I think that uh, you can be the real ambassador on, on, on gender equality, but maybe also broader the diversity as a whole. So I would like to ask you, if you have to prioritize, what will be your first action to schedule uh, at the day of your appointment? And my second question, and that's more content-wise, the ECB has always argued for uh, the need for a fiscal capacity within the Eurozone for the purpose of macroeconomic stabilization. And since the launch of the next generation EU recovery fund, some members from the ECB executive board have publicly stated that this recovery fund should become a permanent facility. And I'm very interested in your view about making the recovery fund a permanent facility. So furthermore, in question 18, this is my last point, of your question, you state that uh, next generation EU bonds facilitate further capital market integration and risk sharing. So what's your view on joint liabilities within the Eurozone in a general? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Nachtgaal, for your, for your question. And uh, maybe I should first thank you for, uh, for uh, kindly calling me a, a, a real ambassador for, for gender balance and I would uh, really endeavor to live up to that to that title. Um, indeed, I have actively uh, pushed for uh, this uh, issue uh, within uh, DMB, the Dutch Central Bank, my present organization. Uh, we now have targets, um, we have percentages on the various levels uh, and we have uh, reached these uh, the, the percentages. Actually, uh, this year uh, we reached uh, the, 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 the percentage that we had set for ourselves for next year. Um, we have um, organized various talent programs uh, in which uh, now the enrollment is 50%. Uh, there is staff networks. Uh, I am um, uh, the sponsor within the uh, board of the uh, of DMB, uh, the DMB Diverse uh, Network. Uh, so if the, we have done a lot of things. And I intend to um, actively push this issue uh, if I were to be appointed. Because let me, let me put this very clearly. Um, you might have seen the EBA report on gender uh, balance. Um, two, -thirds, two thirds of all boards, of all banks uh, in the EU um, are all male. 
two thirds. Uh, more than 40% of the banks do not have a diversity policy as we speak, although since 2014, the Capital Requirements Directive, legislated, co-legislated by you, requires them to do so. The, 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 the EBA calls this alarming, and I call this unacceptable. Um, allow me to say this personally. My wife and I, we have two children. They're both daughters. They're studying. I don't want them to live in a world in which two-thirds of the boards of the banks are all male. So what do I propose to do? You've seen in the questionnaire uh, things that I've set out. Uh, I think basically two things. One, in our supervision, on the basis of existing law, on the basis of the CRD and underlying lower, lower laws, banks are already, already, I already said that, they must have a diversity policy. They must have um, uh, clear targets. They must be transparent about these targets. If they don't reach these targets, they must have additional measures and they must publish those as well. And not just for the boards, but for the entire staff. Now, we can do much more in our supervision to actually require them to live up to these existing um, obligations. That is one thing. And in my, in my, again, in my questionnaire, I've set out very clearly how I think that can be done. Um, secondly, and this is something we do um, actually as a matter of fact here at the Dutch Central Bank, if we set um, targets uh, or requirements for banks, we look in the mirror and we ask ourselves, should we, sell, should we not hold ourselves at least to a bar which is at least as high? And here I would like to embrace the gender targets that the uh, ECB has already set, but I think we, we could, and, and, and I will at least try to go further than that uh, if I were to be appointed, in terms of not just looking at the ECB, but also looking at the entire European system, system of central banks and looking at the entire single um, supervisory mechanism. So that we, as a, as a mechanism um, and as a system uh, of central banks, can have a public sector pipeline, Whereas via our um, supervision, we can have a private sector pipeline. And these two pipelines together can finally, can finally tackle this problem for real. Because that's what we need to do. And then indeed, um, once we are added, diversity is broader, although very important, is broader than just gender. So uh, we need to take that into account as well. Now, one more thing on this issue, um, since you asked so specifically. This might seem like an uphill battle. We have done decades for this. Um, so I'm not pretending that I myself can change this whole thing in a couple of days. Of course I cannot. But I have, I have fought other uphill battles before. Um, and more specifically on climate. Uh, I said in my, in my introductory statement very clearly, climate is a threat for the financial system. We need to manage the climate related risks. Uh, we need to make sure that our banks do that, and we need to make sure that we, as, a, and as the ECB does that with our own, uh, with our own balance sheet. Um, ten years ago, this was highly controversial. Today, 75 members, central banks and supervisors around the world of the NGFS that I chair, um, have seen that this is squarely within our mandate. They have accepted this is squarely within our mandate. It's a very different issue, but it's also an uphill battle. And I am prepared to fight that. Um, that is as to your first question. As to your second question, um, if I recall uh, right, uh, you said that um, you were wondering whether I thought that the EU uh, Next Generation um, um, the, the, the program um, should be a permanent facility. Um, my short answer to that, because I'm afraid uh, that, that maybe I'm taking too much time here, uh, but please, Chair, you, you remind me. Um, and my short answer to that is um, the EU Next Generation Program is key for the, right, for, for the current situation. It's very important that we have it. It fights fragmentation. Um, it, is, um, uh, it helps uh, member states that have less fiscal space. Um, but um, we must be clear, it is a non-permanent facility. Um, now, that having been said, uh, and by the way, uh, it still uh, needs to be worked out and it needs to be put in practice as soon as we can. So it's a little early al already to now evaluate how it works because that would be my way of looking uh, at this. Let's finish it. Let's put it to work. 
uh, let's make sure that the money that's there and that the conditionality that's there is being used, that this money is being used for growth um, generating um, activities, for a, a, a more future proof uh, uh, policies for a more for for digitalization for the um, the transition to a, a carbon neutral economy uh, and if all these things are are being done it is an extremely welcome program uh, and then it's time to evaluate it's time to learn our lessons and of course if you know in the future uh, we were to uh, unfortunately have to face other crises we could then apply these lessons thank you thank you very much I didn't interrupt you about the timing because if I come in, I completely cut you off. So I would just uh, request if you could uh, self-regulate on the timing. I asked the secretariat to put the timing on there so you can see the clock. And so this could help us in uh, keeping the time because uh, in remote, uh, it's very difficult. But uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your extensive uh, answer on uh, gender and uh, climate. Um, now, the next speaker is Ben Giggles from the Greens. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I would like to say that uh, it is unfortunate that this procedure is now uh, falling victim of a larger institutional conflict about uh, the nomination procedure uh, for top financial positions in the EU. This is not mainly about uh, you or your candidature or your country or whatever. It is about the way how the uh, European Council and the Eurogroup have, um, despite numerous calls by the Parliament, um, chosen uh, to treat this affair. And uh, this is, it is truly unfortunate that this now uh, falls on you also. Uh, however, let's, uh, let me uh, move to the substance. So um, my question refers uh, to continuing state aid uh, to uh, failing banks or banks in difficulties. Since the creation of the SRB uh, and the BRRD regulation and directives uh, unfortunately, state aid to banks has not come to a halt. We have seen a whole number of cases where either direct uh, public money or indirectly uh, monetary financing has been used in order to stabilize banks, which we promised to the citizens would be um, dissolved or would be taken over or in any case not rescued again with public money. What, how do you see uh, the, these cases and what would you, if you were a um, member of the governing council, do in order to finally um, uphold the promise uh, to end state aid uh, to banks uh, directly mm. as well as indirectly? Thank you, um, Mr. Giegel, both for uh, your um, carefully worded observation uh, at the beginning of your um, uh, intervention, which I have heard very clearly, uh, but also for your your question. Um, as you uh, as you know, as I said it in my uh, introductory statement, um, I was there from the very beginning uh, of the uh, single resolution board, um, and. Actually, my experience goes back to the, the last uh, last crisis, and um, uh, you know I was working here at various positions within the Dutch Central Bank at the time that um, um, we had to face the situation uh, of um, of falling banks. Um, uh, for example, in, in the, the, the Fortis Bank, uh, I remember very carefully and, 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 and clearly. And I mentioned that uh, not to single out one institution, uh, but to show that um, my understanding um, and uh, my um, way of looking at it is that I am so glad that um, uh, European uh, leaders that back then uh, were able to draw the lessons from that last crisis and to bring to a European level what needed to be brought on a European level. And that is, um, uh, that is uh, the single resolution board and of course then also the uh, single uh, supervisory uh, mechanism. 
Um, now, um, are we there? Are we there yet? Um, is is this perfect? Uh, no. Um, I think that is a, to a certain extent this is a journey, and, and the banks are um, uh, have been working on their resolution plans. Banks have been uh, emitting uh, MREL uh, in order to make sure that they are resolvable. Um, uh, there is, uh, if you if you like, room for uh, for improvement uh, in terms of seeing whether certain banks that are maybe too small um, now for the resolution regime. Uh, but a little bit too big to just uh, enter into um, inter, uh, in insolvency. Whether we should not think of a, of a way of doing that, there are certain specific business models of banks that uh, actually only have uh, or fund themselves mainly uh, by by retail uh, deposits uh, and find it difficult to uh, to to uh, to create um, uh, or emit uh, 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 MREL. Um, so the system is not perfect yet. Um, solvency uh, rules are different uh, in, uh, in, in, in various member states. This actually is part, as you know, of the, uh, of the Capital uh, Markets Union um, uh, proposals, uh, which I'm uh, very much in favor of. So um, um, I would, my answer to you would be, uh, and maybe one more thing, um, the, the way of working together uh, between the supervisory authorities and the resolution authorities, I think has, um, uh, has increased uh, immensely. Um, and for the better, has improved a, a lot, and, and I hope uh, with the fact that I've both served, uh, if you like, on the resolution side and, um, and now uh, will join uh, the, uh, the European Central Bank, um, that I can play a bridge function wherever that were to be needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Derek Ian Epping. Yes, here we are. Uh, Mr. Elderson, I take the opportunity to ask you a question which I already wanted to include in the written questionnaire, but did not succeed to do so due to the opposition from the left. Central bank independence has been premised on a societal consensus about the big picture goals. Usually this was some combination of price stability and full employment. The more you add to those goals, for example, tackling climate change and other sustainability issues, the weaker that consensus will be. In this respect, I would also like to highlight a famous rule of thumb named after a fellow countryman of ours, Mr. Professor Tinbergen. The Tinbergen rule states that policymakers trying to achieve multiple economic targets need to have control over at least one policy tool for each policy tart. I see separate issues to discuss here with your portfolio. And first of all, what is the scope of green central banking? Secondly, if there is one, is it still compatible with the notion of central bank independence? And thirdly, how can the Tinbergen principle be safeguarded. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Epping, and thank you for, for asking me this question. And um, actually, uh, allow me to say that I hope that if appointed um, in all the various interactions that, that, that I hope uh, I will be uh, continue to have with the European Parliament, there will be no question that cannot be asked. Um, that having been said, I think that you broached a very important issue, um, and that is um, uh, central bank independence and how that uh, relates towards um, uh, possibly uh, broader, uh, broader issues. I said possibly, and I will get back to that in a second. Um, central bank independence. The ECB has been set out to be one of the most independent central banks in the world, and I think that it should be very, very careful in um, in, in defending that and making sure that that uh, remains as it is. It has a very clear mandate in the treaty. The treaty is very difficult to change, so that makes it a very independent central bank by means of its mandate, um, but also in terms of uh, operationally, financially, um, and uh, in terms of governance, um, this is a very independent central bank, and it should be. Um, as to your concern 
because I think that that's the way I could uh, interpret it, your concern as to climate. I'm a lawyer. Um, we will always have to make sure that whatever we do falls squarely within our mandate. Uh, what I tried to say earlier, uh, I think in the introductory statement and also in the, in, 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 in the answer to one of the other questions, is that climate change um, does affect our economy. Um, there is just uh, uh, more droughts, there are more wildfires, there, uh, there, there are more windstorms. Um, uh, there, um, the, 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 if you if you like uh, to, uh, to an example from our own country, um, uh, you know if there is if there is more hail, hail storms, the, the the greenhouses uh, in uh, in the Westland, uh, they, uh, they, they 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 are being destroyed more often. If you are insurer or if you are a banker, you have to make sure that you manage that risk. So the economy is changing, is affected by these changes. Um, the ECB must protect its own balance sheet. It must make sure that the risks that we put on our balance sheet, the risks that we take when we take in collateral, that we understand uh, and that we make sure and analyze how climate change um, can, uh, um, can actually uh, increase these risks. So there is no, and that brings me to Tim Berg, um, in my mind, um, we must always stay within our mandate uh, we must always keep to our clear legal um, uh, aims. Uh, but to my mind, uh, it is not on top of, it is within, this is within our mandate. And I would actually go much further, uh, or one step further, if you like. If we did not take into account the climate-related financial risks uh, that our banks that we supervise um, uh, incur, and that we as a central bank in, um, in our uh, various um, the, the monetary policy and the operations incur. If we were not to take that into account, we would actually neglect our mandate. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Elderson. Before giving the floor to uh, the next speaker, just as a reminder to Mr. Elderson, the questionnaire was not done by one single group, but uh, was uh, done by all the groups by consensus all uh, together. So the majority choose the questions, you know, just to clarify how things work uh, in the committee. Uh, so um, now the next uh, speaker, uh, Isabel Benjumea from APP. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you very much, Mr. Elderson, for being here today. First of all, I would like to say that I really do not care whether you're a man or a woman, and I'm very sorry that we spent so much time during this hearing regarding the gender issue. We are here to evaluate your capacities and your qualifications to take this position, and that's a duty, and that's what we should focus on. In this sense, I would like to ask you regarding a project that you have already mentioned, the Capital Markets Union. As you've mentioned as well, we are suffering a huge social and economic crisis that follows the pandemic, the health crisis in Europe. Um, one of the priorities is to create jobs. So we need to help the small and medium-sized enterprises and the entrepreneurs to be able to access the finance in order to keep alive their companies and be able to grow and create new jobs. I would like to ask you, in your opinion, what, what role can the Capital Markets Union play in this sense in order to inject finance to uh, the small and medium-sized enterprises? And also, what's your opinion on the role of the ECB in order to implement a single supervision uh, regarding the Capital Markets Union? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, also, the, the, both for your question and for your, uh, your initial observation. Um, as to the, the Capital Markets Union uh, and how that um, uh, will, will actually then translate uh, into, um, into growth uh, and uh, into uh, financing for, um, for, for, for firms, for uh, small and medium-sized firms, uh, and uh, and thus create um, create uh, employment uh, around uh, around the, uh, the the eurozone and in all regions. 
um, I think that um, indeed um, uh, the Capital Markets Union can can help. Um, it is uh, clear that uh, in uh, as, as, as is widely known uh, within uh, Europe uh, there is a lack of early stage financing for startups. Um, uh, we all know that in the United States that is a much more developed market uh, than here um, in the um, uh, in the uh, in the EU. Um, so I think that that is the first uh, very clear example of where the capital markets union can uh, can help. Um, it can help the capital markets union also to um, to the transition to a more future proof and more digital uh, digital economy, and it can also complement. Uh, and that's why it's so important that both the banking union and the capital markets union are being uh, worked on and further developed uh, as we speak. It can complement uh, bank funding uh, to um, to SMEs and to firms uh, as well. So there, they can they can they can actually work hand in hand and make sure that we um, uh, that we make uh, we make make um, make progress. Now, the the CMU, uh, the capital markets union, is. Um, it's not, it's not, you know, it's it's not a program you can do in 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 one day by by just legislating one or two things. It is, it is, it, 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 there's a, a host of issues that 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 need to be legislated on, uh, a host of uh, of small steps. Some of them very difficult um, because they have to do with uh, legislation that's very much ingrained uh, in, um, in in member states' um, uh, the, the, the judicial. Um, and legislative traditions uh, such as uh, insolvency, um, but um, uh, uh, this is the way to go. So again, uh, my feeling is that um, uh, the Capital Markets Union, uh, although some people when they hear that they might think in terms of um, um, you know just just big firms uh, maybe uh, benefiting from that, uh, is uh, can clearly also play a role in making sure. That um, that smaller uh, startups um, are going to benefit as well. Um, as to your um, um, uh, your question in terms of uh, of supervision, um, indeed, um, certain aspects of the uh, of the capital markets union uh, could be, um, uh, and we would have to think about that uh, maybe more 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 specifically. Uh, but um, there, there, there might be a role for enhanced supervision, uh, for example, by uh, by ESMA of certain aspects of the uh, of the CMU. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have our last uh, speaker, Paul Tang from SND. Thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome, Beste Frank, um, on the issue of uh, gender equality and inequality. Um, this issue is, of course, not about you as, as, you, as a person and the qualifications that you bring. It's about the process. Um, the European Parliament doesn't have the trust that there will be a process that will lead to indeed achieving uh, gender balance uh, in the executive board of the ECB. Uh, and that's uh, a frustration, but that frustration is clearly directed at the member states and uh, and the euro group. Um, let me ask you a question uh, in the area which you have excelled and have uh, have shown to be leading uh, sustainability. Uh, are you willing to discuss the principle of market neutrality? We have. In the European Parliament, long questioned uh, the corporate sector purchase program and the impact it had on uh, it has uh, and had on, uh, on on climate carbon emissions. Uh, are you willing to rediscuss this? Um, I'm happy to hear that, uh, but I also would like to see what is your view on the credit rating agencies. In the answers to the European Parliament, you, you put forward that they do not collect the right data. The right data to assess the financial impact of changing sustainability, but also on sustainability itself. Um, what is the role for the ECB, and isn't there any answers uh, to the European Parliament also an implicit argument for a public rating agency? Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Tang. Thank you well. Um, you ask about the um, the role of the ECB 
um, in terms of um, uh, of climate change, and there are, and I I already uh, mentioned some um, some aspects, uh, but um, let me uh, use the opportunity of your uh, of your question to uh, to go into that a little bit more. Um, as I said before, um, climate change is relevant for supervisors and central banks because um, it creates risks that must be managed. Um, banks need to make sure that um, in their governance, uh, in their business plans, in their risk management, um, in their internal um, information systems, and in their management information on which they take their decisions, that they incorporate um, the risks that are um, being driven by climate change. And not just by climate change, but also by the reaction of um, governments uh, and, for example, also the EU in terms of its Green, green Deal, um, because these reactions, these legislations, they in and on themselves create um, risks as well. These must be managed and we would not be doing our jobs um, and we would therefore not live up to our mandate uh, if we didn't require banks, as the ECB has now done, um, in uh, publishing um, a, um, a manual uh, or a guideline um, uh, um, to, uh, to make sure that they do incorporate uh, that in their business plans and their risk management. This also holds true for us as a central bank. Uh, as I said before, um, we uh, accept collateral. In the statute of the ECB, which is part of the EC treaty, it very clearly states that the collateral that we accept has to be adequate. Now, this adjective adequate needs to understand that that means something. It actually puts a very high burden on us to make sure that we can value that, um, that, 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 uh, that collateral. Uh, in the way that it needs to be valued. Um, it make, and, and this brings me to your, to your question. Um, in as far as we uh, were to, um, uh, to just accept um, uh, credit rating, uh, ratings by credit rating agencies without challenging them um, as to, uh, to what extent they take into consideration these, these climate-related risks. Um, if we don't challenge them, if we don't uh, understand what models they use, if we don't understand what, um, what, what data they, they, they use, then we wouldn't be um, defending um, our uh, balance sheet in the way that we should. So this is not um, about saving the planet. This is about doing uh, our jobs uh, within our mandate um, and safeguarding uh, our balance sheet so that we can make sure uh, that we can continue to serve uh, the European citizen um, uh, by, uh, by using our instruments uh, and, and pursuing uh, price stability as laid down in the tree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Elderson. Uh, now we close uh, uh, the hearing and uh, we will take three minutes break to allow for the next uh, uh, hearing the speaker of the next hearing to test uh, his connection. So thank you again, Mr. Elderson. We'll be in touch. Thank you.